John Lennon and Paul McCartney have assured us that love is all you need. All you need is love. Jesus says to us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We're thinking about emotions this morning. And the Lennon McCartney version of something like love is one we know well. Love is about feelings. Love is a powerful motivator for so much. It's something we can give and receive and it can do great big things in the world. But it's also something that people fall in and out of. If you're married or you've dated, you know that the love you first feel for your beloved is not the same as the love you feel for them now. Marriage, work, family, all the stresses these things can carry can provide us with love but can also make us frustrated and weary. Even if you're single, you're still part of a family and your feelings for friends and for family, they go up and down, don't they? The lockdowns we've experienced have sometimes exposed these very changeable feelings. We end up going from feeling great to perhaps getting up and asking ourselves, will this ever end? Or why is nothing ever easy? Your emotional life, your feelings, they go up and down like the ocean, it ebbs and flows. It's very human, in fact, our psalms contain all the emotions we feel. The psalmist feels everything from deep, silent despair to the joyful, worshipful rejoicing and almost everything in between. And the same things come up in the New Testament too. For example, Romans 15 sees Paul reaching for joy. He says there, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whereas we might see the other extreme in something like 1 Thessalonians 3, with things like distress and persecution. Such is the way of our feelings. If you're a football fan, you'll know the range of feelings and emotions available to you. The tears and the despair of relegation, or the big loss that you just can't seem to get over. And then there's the exhilaration and the joy of the last minute goal and the championship win. People can live and die with almost every game. Now let's listen again to Jesus summarising the whole Bible and the nature of faith in him. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, in the language of scripture, the heart is the seat of our emotions. And from there, some might get the impression that we're supposed to feel a certain way as Christians. If you're not feeling uh, passionate or intense or joyous or victorious in your faith, then you might start to feel guilty and sad. We can start to think that real Christians are mature, they're close to God because they feel the right things in the right way. We can actually end up discouraging ourselves by thinking that if we lack those feelings, then there's something wrong with us. But as we've already briefly seen, feelings are very changeable. We all get out of bed on the wrong side some days. Our feelings are subject to nearly constant change. The whole world knows it. In fact, the whole world is on board with the slogan we've heard during this past year. It's okay not to feel okay. That's great. That's really helpful. But it's a phrase that still lives within the boundaries of feelings. What we need to talk about together this morning is not just feelings, but what we call our affections. Uh, look again at what Jesus says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. What we have there 
is not actually a question of how much we love God or how much feeling we have towards Jesus or how intense our prayer life is. It's a question of what we love. Now, here's the difference. Uh, an emotion, a feeling, is usually a response to something. Someone tells you they love you and you respond with a feeling. The warmth in your chest, the joyful ache of the heart, or maybe even tears of happiness. Why else do you think we all cry at weddings? Whereas an affection is not a response to something, but a sign, a starting point of what we truly love. It's a beginning, a starting point. In, in the negative version of that, it's something we might hate. You might hate a lot, not just in response to it, but because you know it's wrong. For example, pineapple on pizza, it's just wrong. I'm of course kidding, maybe. Think of something more serious. Think of something like child slavery or abuse. Yes, we can feel lots of things in response to the, the horrible stories we see and hear, but we really start from a position of knowing that it's just wrong. That's an affection, not just an emotion. It's a, a posture, not just some temporary response. In the positive version of affections, it's what we long for, it's what we desire, it's what we know to be good. And the man who's probably most helpful on this idea of Christian affections was Jonathan Edwards. Edwards states that Christianity is not just about feelings, but about affections. It's not good enough to know about God or to have heard of Jesus. The true Christian undergoes a change in affections, they love God, they love Jesus, they love the Holy Spirit. They no longer live for themselves, the world or the ways of the devil. Listen again to what Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, the whole Bible, hang on these two commandments. In other words, we need this change, not a change of our feelings, a change in our affections. We can't really change what we feel or sometimes even what we think. We need to change what we love. Loving ourselves alone, you see, is actually a very cruel form of slavery. It holds such promise of happiness and contentment. But the reality is that it delivers nothing. Our feelings are not a good indication of who we really are. But loving God, that Christian affection, means that we love something, someone, unchangeable. Loving others as a result of that means that we are completely free. It is the freedom of freedoms because it promises us everything and it delivers more than we could ever imagine. Now, how do we change what we love? Well, that change comes from God. Real change doesn't come from just being grateful for what God might give us. That's actually a version of self-love. But real change comes from real attraction to who God is. God's holiness is what we're to love the most. His wisdom is lovely because it's holy. His Majesty is holy. There's nothing else like it. There's no one as wise or majestic or beautiful as God. And our affections change when we come to know more of who God really is, to know more of what Christ has really done. And when we're increasingly aware of the Spirit's operation in our lives, we're listening for his voice. Our affections, our starting point with God, cannot be moved or changed by music or singing, by great words and soaring preaching, or even by being part of a big, exciting church or crowd. But our hearts can be moved, our affections can be changed to love God when we're drawn by the Spirit to know Him. 
better. In other words, you cannot work on your feelings or affections by focusing on your feelings and affections. But you can change your affections by focusing on God. Now our communion table is a big helper in that regard. It has nothing to do with how we might be feeling, but everything to do with who God is. It is a fact of grace. And no matter how we would come to that communion table, it has nothing to do with how we're feeling. Feeling high or low, joyful or maybe full of shame, happy or sad. This table tells us God loves us. Jesus has spilled blood for us and the Spirit seeks to comfort us. We can see the source of our affections in the table but we should also witness them in the church too. Jesus doesn't just say, love God with everything you have. He tells us to love each other. Here's an example of that. If I love someone and I need to rebuke them or, or correct them, I would very naturally be full of nerves and, and worry about speaking to them. But if I love them, if I have real affection for them, I will rebuke them with no fear of rejection or even a fear of what they might think of me because I know that the good and godly thing to do is to gently rebuke them. Fear of rejection or, or fear of anger could stop me doing that because those fears spring from a love of myself. I don't want to get in trouble. And just as equally, if one of you needs to rebuke and correct me, I need to put aside pride and, and anger and embrace what it takes for you to have that kind of conversation. A real love for God and the good of those he has saved. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments.